Well, welcome back to Global Supply Chain Week, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Right now joining us is Captain William Waitira. He's with the U.S. Coast Guard. He's going to hear, he's here to talk about a whole bunch of stuff that's going on, particularly uh, with uh, ice breaking and how important that is for the U.S. and also uh, for uh, the global economy, all kinds of things going on there. So Captain Waitira, appreciate you joining us. Uh, why don't we start off, tell us a little bit about your background and experience uh, with the Coast Guard. Hey. Thanks, Nick. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I'm, uh, I'm the captain of the Coast Guard Cutter Polar Star. It's our nation's sole heavy icebreaker. Uh, I've been on board uh, for just over a, a year and a half now. Um, I was here for a year as the executive officer prior to taking over in command last summer. My, my main career balance has been focused on icebreaking. Uh, in fact, Polar Star was my very first assignment as an ensign 20 years ago. And I've been breaking ice on the East Coast and the West Coast and the Great Lakes and in the Arctic and Antarctic ever since. And you've been in the Coast Guard a long time. You have a lot of experience. You're a seasoned. And there, there are a lot of icebreakers that do work in those kind of inland waterways in those places that you mentioned. Uh, but then we have the Polar Star, which is the heavy icebreaker. Uh, it's, which means it's big and it weighs a lot, but what else does that mean? What exactly is a heavy icebreaker and, and classifies it as a polar icebreaker? Absolutely. When Polar Star was designed, it was replacing the, the wind class icebreakers that were built in the 1950s. And they were much smaller and less powerful. And so they always went everywhere and worked in tandem. There would be two or three of them breaking ice at the same time. When Polar Star and our sister ship Polar Sea were designed, the intention was for them to be able to operate anywhere on the planet, any time of year, independently, by themselves. And so that really informs our characterization as a heavy icebreaker. And so these are you know, quite powerful vessels, and um, we'll kind of get to what goes behind those missions in a bit, but um, this latest mission uh, started back in December, uh, and you were out there for a few months. Uh, we did, uh, you helped me a little bit uh, earlier in the year, back in January, when you all made a pit stop, I believe, in Alaska, and we talked about the ship a little bit, but you've done a lot more since then. Uh, so this latest mission, what, what were the goals? Uh, I know you did all kinds of stuff. There was scientific research. There was, of course, the ice breaking and uh, there was also a national security objective. So what were all the goals and were they all met? How did the mission go? Absolutely. The, the mission was a tremendous success. And as we talked about back uh, last month, the mission was, was really kind of put together on short notice. Polar Star has, has been directed every year to go south to Antarctica to support the U.S. Antarctic program and the National Science Foundation to provide logistics and uh, icebreaking services for their sea lift to get supplies in and out of McMurdo Station on the Antarctic continent. This year, due to the global pandemic, they withdrew their request for support, creating that excess capacity for the Coast Guard and Polar Star. And we knew immediately that we would be best suited and best placed to go direct our efforts in the Arctic. And you're exactly right. We had three main focuses to our mission. The first element was definitely a strategic national security type initiative. Uh, we were going to go show the world in no uncertain terms that the U.S. is an Arctic nation, that we care about the Arctic, and that we're going to continue to operate and defend our natural resources and sovereign rights in that region. The second element of our mission was for training. As maritime activity in the Arctic continues to grow and the U.S. invests in new infrastructure to execute Coast Guard missions and national interests in that region, we're going to need the people. We're going to need the experts, the operators who know exactly what they're doing up there. And so this mission was an opportunity to take a whole bunch of folks up to the Arctic to get that experience and hone that proficiency so that we'll be ready to operate there when these new polar security cutters and other platforms come online. And then the third part of the mission focused on scientific research. We worked with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute and the University of Washington, and we were deploying sensors and collecting data so that they can study the Arctic. This was such a unique opportunity for them. It had been so long since 
a surface ship had deployed into the Arctic in the winter, it's really largely unknown what's going on up there. We, we have remote sensing from satellites, but this was a chance to actually do measurements of the water column and of the ice that were otherwise impossible. Sounds like you were busy. You had a crew, if I remember right, of about 120 officers and scientists uh, that were doing all the research, all the other work on the vessel. What are the logistics behind a mission like this? How long does it take to prepare? What goes into, prep into the preparation uh, for a mission such as this one, uh, or just ice breaking missions in general? I'm sure they all vary a little bit, but um, what are the logistics and preparation like? And also, how do you prepare and mitigate for uh, disruptive weather out there too on the seas? Absolutely. Polar Star is 45 years old. She was commissioned in 1976. And it is truly a, an incredible Herculean effort to keep this ship running and keep her operational to carry out these missions. It's a year long process. And we were lucky insofar as that we were investing a lot of their time and resources and energy in getting the ship ready to deploy to Antarctica. And so it was only a, a minor change in, in the grand scheme of things to take that turn to the north and go to the Arctic in lieu of deploying to the south, to the Antarctic. There was a, a number of changes that we had to adjust and, and get ready for, including a lot of uh, navigation charts and, and other predictive software that we needed to look at the ice and, and, and predict the conditions that we we're going to experience. Um, but that really dovetailed well into our existing plans. We brought an ice analyst from the National Ice Center in Suitland, Maryland with us, who provided twice daily briefings on the ice conditions as well as the weather conditions that we'd be encountering. And this was my first time to the Arctic in the winter. And I'll tell you, it was incredibly challenging. It wasn't just the weather and, and the weather was shockingly bad. As I'm sure some of your listeners know, the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea are, are treacherous this time of year. Uh, we also faced hurricane force winds and ice that was constantly moving and shifting, um, blown and, and drifting with the wind, um, creating pressure fields and, and areas where windrows would be eight and 10 feet thick. Really, really challenging conditions that were only exacerbated by the total lack of daylight. The darkness was a massive challenge. At one point in the middle of our trip, uh, from about the 20th of December uh, on into about New Year's, we had 10 straight days of darkness when the sun did not rise. I mean, that that's just unbelievable that that kind of environment overall, and still you got back on schedule, right? Or maybe even a little bit before you had planned on, a little bit ahead of we schedule. Did. We did, we, we actually added a port visit in Juneau, Alaska on our way home. We initially had planned on going to Dutch Harbor twice. Um, after the first stop in Dutch Harbor, it, it became pretty clear that the, the value to the ship and to the crew was not there. Due to the pandemic restrictions, we weren't allowed to go off the ship. We, we were basically sequestered on board in quarantine. And so it didn't make sense to go back there. We programmed a stop in Juneau instead of that. And we were able to spend a couple of days in Southeast Alaska. We went to Glacier Bay, uh, we, we saw Icy Strait, and that was a great, great opportunity for the crew to see some of the natural splendor and, and beauty that Alaska has to offer. In conjunction with our stop in Juneau, Senator Murkowski, uh, the senior Senator from Alaska came out from Washington and visited the crew and presented us with a, a unit commendation, recognizing our accomplishments and our, our, our record setting transit uh, to 72 North in the winter, which is the furthest North that any U.S. surface ship has, has ever accomplished during the winter months. That's great, congratulations on that. Thank you. That's pretty fantastic. I, I wanna ask you, you know, all, all the work that the Polar Star does, the other uh, icebreakers out there, how does that, impact the U.S. and the global economy. I mean, you're besides, you know, you're clearing shipping lanes for uh, container ships, which is really important, but you're doing all that other work too. So so what is the impact on, on the economy for our country and across the globe? I think the, the first level, and particularly as it relates to this mission that, that we went on this winter, um, it is somewhat geopolitical. Uh, Russia and China have both staked out expansive interests and are investing heavily in 
infrastructure and icebreakers and, and forward operating locations in the Arctic, uh, trying to wield power and influence in that region. And it's very clear that presence equates to power and the ability to influence future decisions. And so that's why it's so critical for the U.S. to invest in that infrastructure and continue to build icebreakers so that we can be part of that discussion and, and make sure that our interests, whether it's commercial uh, or other diplomatic interests, are heated in future discussions. As icebreaking relates to commerce, um, particularly domestically for us right now, there's a major demand for icebreaking services on the Great Lakes and on the East Coast to move uh, goods and materials year-round when the waterways are frozen. As the Arctic begins to recede, the, the sea ice begins to recede, there is increased demand and, and there's certainly a signal that we're going to start seeing more commercial vessel traffic and, and possibly destinational or transit shipping through the Arctic. The responsibility for ice breaking and for maritime safety and security falls on the Coast Guard. As more vessel traffic is transiting through icy waters, the Coast Guard is going to bear a responsibility to ensure that that shipping is done safely and securely. So so up in the polar regions, down in Antarctica, when the Polar Star has been there, uh, over all the years uh, in general that you've been involved in ice breaking, have you seen effects of climate change or what you think might be climate change? I mean, is there less ice to break in some areas? Absolutely. You know, I, I first went to the Arctic in 2000, um, and, and it, it, the ice was challenging that year. Um, I went up again in 2001, uh, and, and similarly challenging conditions and, and large expanses of sea ice. Um, I went to the North Pole 15 years later in 2015, and the ice conditions had changed markedly. Uh, the ice was softer, there was less of it, and it was much thinner. Um, it, it's, it's incredible that in the span of a Coast Guard career, it, it's possible to personally see these changes happening. But I, I want to point out that my trip to the Arctic last month in the winter um, what was a bit of an eye-opening experience for me. The ice that we saw was thicker and harder and more challenging than anything I've seen, even in the furthest north and furthest south reaches uh, during the summer months. That ice was hard and thick and, and crunchy. As the ship pushed through it, it, it made a, a calamitous sound. Um, it, it really felt like a perpetual car crash, just squealing tires and twisting metal and, and shattering glass going on for weeks on end. It, it was disconcerting. It is interesting, some of the, those changes that you mentioned, that there's still plenty of ice out there though. I mean, you guys are gonna be in business for a while. Uh, it's not like it's all going away anywhere. So uh, we appreciate everything uh, that you and the Polar Star crew, all the other ice breaking uh, crews out there are doing, all the scientific research, everything else that's involved with that. And uh, Captain Waitira, we re really appreciate you being with us uh, today and taking the time out. I know you're a busy man and uh, we appreciate it. And um, I think uh, folks are gonna enjoy it and really learn a lot. How can folks get in touch with you if they have any questions? What's the best way to do that? Absolutely, so I'm on LinkedIn, you can find me there. You can also uh, send email to my work account, which is my name, William.C, uh, my middle initial, dot Waitira at USCG.mil. Captain Waitira, thanks again so much uh, for joining us. Have a great day out there and be careful. Hey, it's a pleasure. Thanks, Nick.